Thank you, Gina. When Gina first called me and said, would you be willing to give a talk to those of us here at the Catholic Center, I was delighted. And she said, it will be on Ash Wednesday. <laughs> oh, wonderful, because that lets me tell my Ash Wednesday story. And hopefully that will lead into the topic, but let me begin with my favorite Ash Wednesday story. Are you ready? It was about 25 years ago. That's when most of the best things in my life happened. <laughs> it was about 25 years ago, and I was working in the admission office at Boston College, and it was Ash Wednesday. Now, if you know anything about the people of Boston, they're good people, but nowhere near as religious as the people you will find here in Fairfield County. <laughs> <laughs> and so up there, they really don't have the time to go to Mass, but they still want to have ashes. And so I would go, of course, celebrate that morning Ash Wednesday Mass, receive ashes myself, and then make sure that I had a little envelope in my pocket full of ashes. And all during the day, people would come to my office, in the admission office, and they'd ask for ashes, and I'd say a little prayer, and I would give them the ashes. Now, ashes are a lot like loaves and fishes. It just never runs out. <laughs> so that little envelope, out it would come, back it would go, out it would come, back it would go. Now, it just so happened on that Ash Wednesday, there was going to be a college fair at the Heinz Auditorium in Boston. You know how all the colleges have a table and they hand out their brochures. I used to say it was like selling perfume in Filene's basement, you know. <laughs> I'd like to try a little. Well, I was the one that had to cover that college fair. So about 4 o'clock, Ash Wednesday afternoon, I filled my car up with boxes of these catalogs and drive into the Heinz Auditorium. And I drive down into the basement, to the loading dock, about as dark and gloomy and damp an area as you could find. I pull up to the loading dock, oh God, now I'm having to get these boxes out of the car, up on the dock, and somehow or other up to the first floor where the uh, college fair will be. But as I get out of the car, I notice that up on the loading dock, there are about six guys sitting there talking, smoking, about as mean and tough a looking group of people as I have ever seen. Clearly, they were there because they were what, stevedores, dock workers, what have you. Well, very quietly, I get out of the car because I don't want to disturb them. And I have this way I can cover the Roman call. <laughs> so I get out of the car and start to go around in the trunk, and sure enough, what do I hear? Hey, it's a priest. <laughs> and then somebody yells out, Hey, Father, what are you here for? To give us ashes? And there's a big laugh. And then I remember. <laughs> so I reached in my pocket. I said, yes, uh, I was hoping you'd be here. Just give me a second to get up on the uh, loading dock, and then if you'd line up, then I'll give each of you ashes. Well, my God, it was like a bunch of third graders. <laughs> they just lined up. And every one of them, <coughs> turn away from sin and be beholding to the gospel. Well, finally, the last of them looked at me and he said, Oh, Father, is there anything we can do for you? I said, Yeah, you can help me with these boxes. <laughs> and so up went the boxes. Well, the point of this talk was rejoicing that we are a sinful people now saved by Christ. And I think one of the first things we should do, especially on Ash Wednesday, as we look around, and hopefully it'll be true, you've noticed I'm waiting for Mass too. hopefully we'll get our ashes and we'll look around and say, oh my God, look at all the sinners. There are so many sinners out there. I think at times we can get a bit discouraged because there is so much sin in this world. On the other hand, it's an opportunity for great rejoicing. I live in this Jesuit community, 25 of us at Fairfield Prep, Fairfield University, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful men. But every so often they get discouraged by all of the sin in this world. For example, undoubtedly tomorrow somebody will mention, boy, there were a lot of people at Mass getting ashes. They probably won't see them again until Palm Sunday when they can get some palms. <laughs> I always like to say, Thank God there are so many sinful people out there. Because just imagine if there weren't a lot of sinful people out there, 
there wouldn't be anything for us to do. And we'd have to go, like lay people, and get real jobs. No more of the easy life, the clerical life. We'd have to actually do something real. But precisely because there's sin in this world, there's something that we can justify our existence by reaching out to those who need us. What is it? I believe in the exultant. Priest or the deacon will sing, Oh, happy fault, oh, pardon, oh, happy fault, the Felix Culpa, that we have the right to receive such a wonderful and glorious Redeemer. It's because of that happy fault. That was a line that comes from St. Augustine, I believe, in one of his Easter sermons. And he probably got the idea from the Hebrew scriptures, where it talked about horrible as slavery in Egypt was, because of that slavery, we came to appreciate the freedom that followed it. And so it is precisely because there is this opportunity of being able to work with a sinful people, we come to appreciate the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. Let me give you one other story, just in terms of getting a sense of the glory of being able to work with sinful people. A couple of years ago, I took a group of our students down to Kentucky, went down there to build homes. And so we're down there building these houses, and eventually they, one house, we had reached a point where we had to go up on the roof to complete the whole roof area. So I'm standing up there on these beams that run across, looking down about 10 or 12 feet at the cement floor beneath me. And at that point, we have to raise up the roof beams and get them into place. Now, if there's anything I hate more than manual labor, <laughs> it's falling 10 or 12 feet onto a cement floor. <laughs> so this was not my happiest day. Well, I'm standing up there, and there's a young fellow from Kentucky, one of the guys that worked along with us from the late teens, early 20s. And he looks at me and he says, Father, do you like this work? I said, no, I hate it. <laughs> no, let's be honest, I hate it. And then he says, well, oh, funny, Jesus liked it. <laughs> well, you don't try to fool around with me. <laughs> I said, Remember, he got out of carpentry and became a preacher. <laughs> well, obviously, this fellow must have had a degree from the Gregorian, because he looks at me and he says, yeah, and he was dead three years later. <laughs> we find ourselves in a highly imperfect world. Hopefully, we just don't get discouraged by it. We begin to rejoice in it. And I think part of the problem is, of course, especially now talking to you people here at the Catholic Center, or the same way when I'm talking with my Jesuit brothers at, at, at Fairfield University, we are a people for whom religion means so much. And so much of our day is devoted to religion. And it's always hard to understand why for other people, they just don't have that same level of interest that we do. I was just looking at that letter uh, Pope Francis has sent out, and he talks about the globalization of indifference. And of course, there's always a tendency to say, well, is that something new? I always loved, uh, years ago when I was studying in Italy, I believe it was in uh, Padua, to go to the Arena Chapel with all of these wonderful frescoes from Giotto, back in the 13th century. And in one of the frescoes, he has the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And in that story, you see three groups of people. There are those people who are obviously extraordinarily excited, as the scriptures tell us, so excited that Jesus is calling Lazarus forth from the dead. But then there's a small group of people, those scribes and Pharisees, who are obviously deeply upset who is this individual to overturn the standard way, the way we have accepted for so many centuries? But then there's a third group, the individuals who had to roll back the stone. 
Well, they've gone off to have a smoke and have a little conversation. They could care less about what's going on. That's that indifferent group. Not bad people, but they're the people that lack the excitement, that belief in the positive powers of Jesus Christ. And certainly for us, as we look out and as we see people out there, what is it that we can do to be of service to them? And so often, in being of service to them, it means so much for us. A couple of years ago, along with some alumni, we went down to Nicaragua. And we would work in two orphanages in Nicaragua. It was only for a week, but work in these orphanages in Nicaragua, which had been established for orphans, who also had serious either physical or mental disabilities. You couldn't get any lower than those individual, those children. But when we went down there, we discovered there was this wonderful union of good Catholic American money, because that's where the money was coming from, from here in New England, and good Nicaraguan Catholic love, the men and women who were running these orphanages. Now, I'll always remember the woman, Julia. She was in charge, spoke excellent English, and she guided us through that week that we spent there. And the one thing she used to say over and over again is, we all feel sorry for these children, but remember, this is the opportunity we have to express God's love. This is our challenge, and we show them that God loves them. And so as we receive those ashes today, hopefully, as we look around and we see all these sinners, we say, whoa, look at how much work there is to do. <laughs> I am going to be really wonderfully fulfilled today as I share with them this person of Jesus Christ, recognizing this happy fault. But then it really gets tough when, I'm not sure, but I suspect most of you, like myself, have really, hardly have we left Mass having received ashes what do we do? We look in the mirror. Did the priest do a good job? <laughs> right? Did he get it just right? But hopefully, in looking in the mirror, we say, hey, wait a minute. I'm no different than they are. I'm a sinner myself. And I'm not afraid to show that to the rest of this world. I'm a sinner myself. I always say that the good Christian is the person who can look in the mirror, even with that mark on their forehead, and say, Dear God, there is your gift to humanity. What wonderful things can I do today? Now, do any of you get the uh, daily bulletin that comes in by email from the USCCB, is it? United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Did you see today's? I was a little surprised. You feel with the, what is it, a selfie? I think you're doing a selfie of me right now. <laughs> is it a selfie? Is that what you do? I, I don't have one of those cameras. But it said, some the bishops would say, would everyone please send us a selfie of themselves with ashes? <laughs> well, I'm not sure that I want to send that to the bishops. <laughs> but isn't it true that getting ashes today, we admit that we are sinners? Wonderful. Why is it so wonderful? We can admit that we are sinners. I would like to think that in doing that, the first thing is it allows us to be able to sympathize with other human beings. We're not arrogant. We're not haughty. We don't say, oh, if only you could be like me. No, I am a sinner also. And so what I can do is lead you to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe the way I have a sense experienced this negatively in my own life is I am very fortunate, wonderfully healthy, wonderfully healthy. My mother just celebrated her 101st birthday, and she's doing very well. Now, it's a little discouraging because I can remember when she turned 90, didn't think she'd have that many years left. And whenever she'd see me, her son, the priest, she'd always say, Father Charlie, I hope you're preparing a nice eulogy for my funeral. <laughs> but then when she turned 100, and about the same time I turned 70, she started saying, I hope they'll s let me say a few words at your passing. <laughs> <laughs> but I have had the good and 
wonderful experience. Just good genes, I think, to be a wonderfully healthy person. But consequently, whenever someone comes to me with their aches and their pains, their long-term suffering, a young woman, one of our graduates now we're praying for because uh, she is now at the Mass General Hospital in an induced coma, she's only 23 years old. I find it so hard to be sympathetic because I have never suffered myself. Oh, maybe I should take that back on rare occasions. I took a group of students down to Ecuador to work with the poor and needy. Walking down one of those rough roads in the barrios of Ecuador, I tripped, fell, and broke both my arms. Oh! But then I said, oh, now I know what it's like to feel pain. <laughs> and always remember this, when you're in this preaching business, you do not have good or bad experiences, you have experiences that lead to good or bad sermons. <laughs> and consequently, with my two broken arms, I was going around, as I do, help out in different parishes, and the pastors loved it. Because I would say, Mass, with my arms all wrapped up, I could still elevate the host, the chalice, they're not that heavy. And the pastor said it doubled the take at the collection. <laughs> but for once, I could sympathize with people. And you know human beings who have suffered all their life, not because they did anything bad, but just that's the way life is. And so when we say, I admit that I am a sinner, hopefully it allows us to sympathize with those who suffer from their own personal guilt, their feelings of inability, their self-anxiety. Hopefully it gives us that strength, that positive. The second thing is, unless we recognize ourselves as sinners, how can we possibly go out and preach about the saving power of Jesus Christ, that redemptive power that Christ offers to us? I used to have a superior call us in every so often want to talk about our prayer life. And he used to say to me, you feel close to Jesus. And I said, well, I, I don't want to get too close to Jesus. You know, he's all kind of bloody. It, it doesn't smell that good, you know, and covered with dirt. He, he, I'm not sure that I can get that close to Jesus. But hopefully it's because you recognize that you are a sinner that you say, oh, tough as that crucifixion is, I know how much I need your love and I need the sacrifices that you have made for me. I was certainly upset when uh, this Pope Francis was elected, because I presume when he took the name Francis, being a good Jesuit, it was after Francis Xavier. All I discovered was after Francis of Assisi. On the other hand, I must say I do love Francis of Assisi, and one of the things I love most was that wonderful painting, I think it was by Thugaron, which shows Francis of Assisi Embracing the person of Jesus Christ on the cross. And there he is, probably the first saint to experience the stigmata, the actual wounds of Christ in his own hands, feet, and around his forehead. But there is Francis embracing the cross of Jesus Christ. But how can you possibly do that? Someone that, for any normal human being, would be somebody that you would tend to stay away from, unless you yourself recognize that you are a sinner and that you need the person of Jesus Christ in your lives. And so finally, why are we sinners? Because that's what gives us the impetus to go out and preach the message of Jesus Christ. Now, another reason when Gina called me and said, would you say a few words here at the Catholic Center, I said, wonderful. Because for the first time in my 37 years on and off here in Fairfield County, I get to thank the people who have made my life so meaningful. I don't think it's any secret, but I only have one sermon. You've actually heard most of it. <laughs> the people at St. Anthony's will hear it next week. The people at Holy Family will hear it the week after. The people at Holy Cross the week after that. But because I only have one sermon, I have to go to a new parish every week. <laughs> The one thing that is good about this sermon, and believe me, you just test me, 10 minutes from now you will have forgotten everything that I said. 
And so when I come back to a parish, they don't remember that I gave them that sermon a month earlier. But it has given me the opportunity to experience the vitality of the church here in Fairfield County, so much of which is attributable to the work that you are doing. Now, that's not to say, hey, there's always problems and difficulties. And certainly after 37 years, I've seen my challenges here. But ultimately, the vibrancy, the dynamism of all that we see, whether it's going over to Burton Center, or whether it's going down to Norwalk to a room to grow, whether it's just attending a parish mission, always and over again. And I must say, I don't want to make you feel bad, Brian, but reading the Fairfield County Catholic, it always picks up my spirits, unless I don't see my picture in it. <laughs> but it is such a vibrant diocese, and I thank all of you for doing that. <clears throat> Let me finish with a kind of my final story here, maybe a good example of why it is so wonderful that we recognize that we are sinners and rejoice in all that we can do for ourselves and for others. Every so often, uh, a couple of us, uh, usually a, a priest, a minister, and a rabbi, go over to 3030 Pi. 30, did that get a lot, 3030 already? Were you there? Go, go over to Watermark to 3030. And they'll have the elderly there, and we will give them a talk on some subject from our three religious points of view. And this particular topic was on hope. So the rabbi, this Jim Prosnick, gave a talk on hope from the Jewish perspective. Probably David or Alita Rose spoke from the Protestant perspective, and then I spoke from the Catholic perspective. Well, when it was over, we had questions. And one gentleman stood up and he said, Father, I'd like to ask you. I'm Jewish. My family, when I was a little child, escaped from Austria in 1938. And thank God we were able to come to this country and have done well ever since. But not my grandparents, not my cousins, not my aunts and uncles. They were all killed in the Holocaust. Can you say to me that I should have hope? And I looked at him and I said, well, you may not understand this not being a Catholic, but I'm a Jesuit priest. I can speak out of either side of my mouth. <laughs> now for $5, I will give you a powerful sermon on despair. I will talk about how horrible, how ugly, how mean and nasty this world is, how there are the people like Hitler and like Stalin and Pol Pot and Mussolini and so many others that by the time I finish, like Job, you will just fall on the ground and say, Lord, why did you ever bring me out of the womb? There was no point in my being born. There's no point in living. I can hardly wait to die. Or, if you wish, for five dollars, I will give you a sermon on hope. I will tell you about the struggles, let's say, of the Jewish people, of the Israelites, but how they were able to free themselves from the slavery of Egypt and have been able to do so much for so many other groups, I think of African Americans in this country, with that wonderful story of the Passover, of their escape from slavery. And then I can talk about the role of Jesus Christ for us Christians and how Jesus has led us out of the slavery to sin and has given us new hope as we look forward to the resurrection which each of us will experience and the eternal heavenly kingdom still to come. So it's up to you. Which do you want? Well, with that, he reached in his pocket. He did. Pulled out a couple of dollars. He said, I think I'll take the one on home. <laughs> and so for each of us, on this Ash Wednesday, can we look around and recognize all the sinners are out there and so much great work that we have to do and be filled with hope? Can we look into the mirror and see ourselves and recognize the sinners that we are say precisely because of that we can go out and do so much for other human beings because we sympathize with them we appreciate their needs but we know how much they need the message of Jesus Christ so today I look forward to this mass I look forward to receiving the ashes and I'm so deeply grateful to you for allowing me to come and share a few of my stories with you and so let us finish that great prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola, prayer that you have lived out so well in your own lives here at the Catholic Center.
Lord, teach us to be generous. Teach us to serve thee as thou deservest to be served. To give and not to count the cost. To fight and not to heed the wounds. To work and not to seek for rest. But knowing that we do thy will, and in that way we'll be rewarded. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Well, I said I'd talk for a half an hour. I went for just 25 minutes. Is that okay? I can tell you more stories if you want to hear them. People are always saying, what do you think about Pope Francis? You know, of course, he is the first Jesuit. He broke a 400-year tradition. I'm not sure the St. Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Jesuits, would be happy. But anyways, we have a Jesuit Pope. Am I happy? No, I'm not. In the old days, when I would sit down with a bunch of my Jesuit brothers, have a nice meal, I would talk openly, never worrying that one of them might become Pope. <laughs> <laughs> now when I sit down, I'm looking around and saying, uh-oh, better be careful what I say in front of this guy. He could be Pope someday. But again, I thank you so much. God bless, and I'll look forward to this Mass together.